Good evening, folks. A warm welcome to you. Good to see you once again this evening as we gather to worship God together. Well done for making it out on a cold evening. It's good to have you here with us. Just a, a few things to mention before we get underway tonight. This evening we're once again in the book of Mark's Gospel. We're coming to the next few verses in chapter 7, so we'll turn there later on. Uh, and then in the week ahead, a number of different things uh, to bear in mind. There's a meeting of presbytery tomorrow evening at half past seven over at Strand Millis. The women's meeting is taking place here on Tuesday evening at eight o'clock. That's going to continue in the, the series of studies, uh, looking at those videos on the theme of contentment. And uh, mince pies served as well as tea and coffee as well during the course of that evening. Wednesday evening is our prayer gathering here at half past seven. Uh, Thursday is mums and toddlers at half past ten. And then next Sunday, as I mentioned this morning, we're away. But uh, we have the Sunday school at quarter past ten. The morning service at half past eleven with Phil Dunn, who works with EMF, is going to be coming to take that service. And then Adam Riley is going to be here for the six o'clock service. Uh, a week tomorrow at half past seven, there's also a daylight Christian uh, prison ministry prayer meeting here, uh, so do bear that in mind. And also the, the Christmas publicity, which I indicated this morning, is now here and ready. Uh, we've got hundreds of these to give away, so take as many as you would like and hand them out to friends and family. Invite them to those Christmas services. And we're hoping to distribute them as well throughout this local area. So if you are able uh, to help out with that, do let me know and we'll uh, get as many as possible out into our community ahead of the uh, Christmas services. Well, let me read some verses now from Psalm 105 as our call to worship uh, tonight. The psalmist writes, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Praise the Lord. And on that note, our first item of praise this evening is from Psalm 96. If you could turn there, please, in the book of praise. We're going to be turning later on, as I said, to Mark chapter 7. And it's one of the few occasions when Jesus uh, leaves uh, Jewish territory, uh, goes off to Gentile territory, and uh, meets a, a Gentile woman there. And uh, we see how uh, she is brought to, to faith in Christ and has come to trust in him and receive grace in him, a sign that the gospel is not only for the, the Jew but for the Gentile as well, and indeed to the ends of the earth. And we're going to sing of that wonderful truth now as we turn to these verses from Psalm 96. We'll sing up to verse 9. Oh, sing a new song to the Lord, sing praises to his name, and his salvation day by day let all the earth proclaim. Psalm 96 verses 1 to 9. We'll stand to sing.
seated. We come to God in prayer now. Let's pray together. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Our Father, we come to you in prayer now and we've just sung and heard the words of this psalm which call us to sing to you and to bless your name, to tell of your salvation, tell of your glory, tell of your marvellous works among all the peoples of the earth. And we thank you that this evening we can gather to do these things, we can gather as your people and we can sing your praises and we can tell of your marvellous works as your word is read and proclaimed and as we consider Christ and all that he has done for us. We thank you that in him we can receive your salvation. We can find forgiveness for all of our sin and receive the gift of eternal life with you. And so, Father, we pray that this evening, as we have gathered together as your people, that you would send your Holy Spirit amongst us, that he would empower everything that we do this evening, that he would equip us to praise you as we ought, that he'd empower us as we sing your praises and as we pray to you and as your word is read and preached. Father, we pray that the Spirit would open your word to us, that he would point us to your Son, Jesus, we pray that he would open blind eyes, that he would soften hardened hearts, that he would change us and shape us to be more like our Lord Jesus, with lives that are filled with the fruit of righteousness for your glory's sake. Our Father, we confess that we are those who've sinned against you. We've sinned in our thoughts and our words and our actions. We've dishonoured you. We've brought your holy name into disrepute. We've deliberately and willfully disobeyed you. Father, we know that we deserve your righteous condemnation. And we cry out to you for your mercy. We pray that you would not treat us according to our iniquities, but deal with us according to the perfect merits of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom all of the condemning power of the law's accusations has been fully exhausted. So tonight, Father, we pray you'd forgive us for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, and that you'd change us to be more like him as you build up your people and you do so all for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name, we ask all of these things. Amen. Well, we've been reminded already this evening as we've considered those words from Psalm 96 that the the grace and the glory of God extends throughout the whole of the earth. People of every nation can receive the grace of God in Christ. And as we come to our words of encouragement this evening from 1 John chapter 2, let's be reminded of that once again. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We're going to sing hymn number 64, if you could turn there please. The passage to which we turn this evening in Mark chapter 7 it is a somewhat uh, perplexing uh, passage, as we shall see when we get there momentarily. Uh, and uh, for a while it's hard to understand why Jesus acts as he does and why he says what he does in those verses. Uh, but of course we know that uh, his ways are above our ways and uh, what he does and what he says is all perfect. Uh, sometimes the providence of God uh, leaves us perplexed, doesn't it? And we're going to sing of that uh, now as we come to hymn number 64. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Hymn 64, 
And again, we'll stand to sing. seated and let's come to that passage of scripture now this evening as we turn in our bibles to mark chapter 7 and we're picking up the story tonight in verse 24 mark chapter 7 and verse 24 you remember last week jesus was engaged in a debate with with some pharisees and scribes and he was teaching the people as well and the story continues there in verse 24. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know. Yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. This is God's word. We thank him for it and pray that as we come to that passage this evening, he'll help us uh, to understand it and receive uh, his word with faith and love and lay it up in our hearts and practice it in our lives. We're going to pray together now, uh, bringing uh, to God our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. So let's pray together. Our Father, having just heard these verses from uh, Mark chapter 7, where we meet this Syrophoenician woman uh, coming to Jesus and pleading to him on behalf of her daughter. And then Jesus showing his power by delivering the little girl from the unclean spirit. We thank you for the encouragement that this gives us 
to bring all of our prayers before you this evening in Christ's name, uh, bringing before him all of our needs in prayer, bringing before him in prayer all of those that we are concerned for. And so then with confidence that we draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Father, there are many in our thoughts at the moment going through very difficult seasons of life at the moment. We think of those known to us here who are afflicted with illness. And we pray on for those households that have been affected in recent days, either with COVID or with other illnesses as well. Those not able to be out at the moment, those struggling to recover. Lord, we pray for each one as they're laid up this evening and not able to be out. Uh, we pray that they would know your healing touch, that you would strengthen them and heal them in these days ahead. Again, we do pray on for Stephen. We thank you for the way in which you have brought him through his chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Our Father, as that continues to take an effect, Lord, we do pray that the treatment would be effective in healing Stephen's body thoroughly and that you would give him health and strength in these coming days. And Father, there are others as well going through times of great concern and great sadness. And we do pray on for Mary Shannon's family, uh, for Andrew and for Clarissa, as uh, they grieve the, the loss of this baby. Father, we do just pray for that family, that indeed they would come to the throne of grace and receive mercy and find grace to help in this time of need. Again, Father, we're thankful for the way in which you've answered prayers in relation to Andy and Hazel's granddaughter, Abby. Thank you that she is safely home. Father, we pray for her in these coming days for a full recovery and your help for everything that lies ahead as well. And Father, even as we bring before you all of these many physical needs that people have and the sadness and, and grief that they're dealing with, we pray as well for the, the spiritual needs of those around us. We think of those who are outside of Christ. We pray for those family members that we've prayed for many times, those friends, neighbours and colleagues. Perhaps countless times we have brought them before the throne of grace and yet it is as if heaven has remained silent and there has been no answer forthcoming. And Father, we pray that you would help us to be persistent in prayer, to bring those loved ones before you and we pray that in your good time you would work in their hearts that you would draw them to the savior that they would come to him in repentance and faith and be welcomed in to the household of god and to that end father we pray as well for our ministry as a church and especially as we head into this christmas season we do thank you for the additional opportunities that are given to us at this time of year as we can share the Christmas message and all that it means with those around us. And as the special Christmas services are planned in coming weeks, Father, we do pray that many would be brought along to those services and that your word as it's preached would go forth with real clarity and power and be effective in the saving of many. We pray even this evening, Father, as your word is proclaimed that you would pour out your spirit upon us that he would empower the preaching and the hearing that all that is done would be done in your strength and for your glory and in jesus name we ask all of these things amen so let's sing together once again hymn number 267 267 behold the mountain of the lord in latter days shall rise on mountain tops above the hills and draw the wondering eyes 267 will stand to sing
take a seat. And let's come to God in prayer together. Let's pray. Father, we again thank you for your word. What a privilege it is to be here this evening and to hear the words of Jesus as he speaks his word to us by his spirit through the scriptures. And we pray once again for the spirit's help that he would enable us all as we sit under your word this evening. Lord, may the Spirit be very active in this time, pointing us to Jesus and creating and nurturing and strengthening faith in him so that your people are built up and encouraged in Christ, in whose name we pray all of these things. Amen. So please do have that story from Mark's Gospel open in front of you. It's chapter 7 and verses 24 to 30, as we hear God speak to us through his word tonight. Here we are all of a sudden at the 5th of December. It is less than three weeks until Christmas, and it's a busy time of year, isn't it? Plans to make, people to visit, cards to write, presents to buy, presents to wrap, and send. And I'm sure that many of us here this evening, if we're feeling busy at this time of year, will be looking forward to three weeks' time or thereabouts when all the carols have been sung, all the presents have been exchanged, all the turkey has been eaten, and there is at last an opportunity, after all the rushing around that Christmas brings, to have some time to rest. And as we come to this story in Mark chapter 7, we find Jesus in a very similar state of mind. He has been snowed under in his ministry. And for quite some time, he's been trying to find a time and a place to rest. Remember, right back in chapter 6, verse 31, he said to his disciples, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. And we're told there many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And those plans to rest were put on hold because you remember a crowd of over 5,000 people followed Jesus and the disciples and then needed ministering to And so then Jesus and the disciples went over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, away from the crowd. And yet look what was waiting for them there. Chapter 6, verse 54. When they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. Jesus is still busy. And then at the start of chapter 7 he's still busy Uh, some scribes and pharisees as we saw last week came from jerusalem and they've come to challenge jesus about his ministry and so jesus spent some time debating with those religious leaders and teaching the crowd then about this problem of legalism and what it really means either to be clean or unclean before god So will it ever stop? Will Jesus ever get the chance to find somewhere to rest? And so here's what he decides to do. He decides he's going to go away for a day or two. I'm sure you've done a a similar thing from time to time. Uh, You've said, life has just been so busy recently. Let's just head away somewhere for just a couple of days and recharge our batteries. And so Jesus did that. He headed up north and he goes to the region of Tyre and Sidon. As I said earlier, this is one of the very few occasions where we learn about Jesus leaving Jewish territory and heading off into Gentile occupied areas. But Jesus thinks, well, this will get me away from all the crowds for a while. And so Mark tells us, Jesus entered a house and did not want anyone to know. 
And you see, don't you, he's still looking for a chance for some peace and quiet, a chance to rest and recuperate, a chance to recharge his batteries so that he can then give himself afresh to his ministry with renewed energy. And yet, once again, that's not quite how things worked out. Mark says, yet he could not be hidden. He has become so well known. His ministry is so popular that even when he goes away into Gentile territory now, everyone still seems to know exactly who he is and where he is. Jesus has just arrived at this house where he's going to be staying for this short time away. You can imagine him perhaps, he's just taken his coat off, he's put his suitcase down, he has just sat down in the living room, and immediately, we're told, someone then bursts into the house, wanting to see Jesus. It's a woman, she's a Gentile, she's from this area, roughly speaking, she's from Syrophoenicia originally, and she's heard about the ministry of Jesus. And she has now heard that, surprisingly enough, Jesus has come to visit her neck of the woods. And she bursts in because she wants to see Jesus. Now, why in particular does she want to see Jesus? It's because she has a little daughter who is possessed by an unclean spirit, a demon, this woman, of course, has heard that Jesus has driven out many demons before. And so she comes to Jesus to beg him that he might drive this demon out of her daughter. How is Jesus going to respond to this situation? And as we look at how this scene plays out in these next few verses, I want us to notice three things from the story. They all begin with the letter P to help us remember them. And I want us to notice that there is a prayer offered, there is a parable to consider, and there is power at work. A prayer, then a parable, and then power. And so firstly, the prayer or the plea, if you will. Uh, this Syrophoenician woman uh, gives us a wonderful model in how to pray in the way that she comes to Jesus for help. She brings her plea, her petition, her prayer before Jesus. And I want you to notice a number of things about that prayer. Notice, first of all, her prayer springs from faith in Jesus. It springs from faith in Jesus. Now, where do we see the faith in the passage? We see that first of all, of course, in the way in which she comes to Jesus. She comes to him, she fell down at his feet. It is a sign of reverence before him. This is a mark of respect for Jesus. She's humbling herself before him. She's acknowledging that he is greater than her. In fact, she calls him Lord. And having come to him, and fallen at his feet, she cried out to him for help. Mark says she begged Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. So clearly she knows that Jesus is able to help. She believes in him for that. And so notice just very briefly, her prayer springs from her faith in Jesus. And her faith is demonstrated by all these actions and words that, that she demonstrates in the story. She comes to Jesus. She humbles herself before him. She acknowledges that he is Lord. That she believes that he has power to help. She cries out to him for that help. Her prayer springs from faith in Jesus. And then secondly, notice that her prayer was marked with persistence. Now, here in Mark's Gospel, it's not something that Mark especially focuses on, but in Matthew's account of the same story, the persistence of this woman comes shining through. It's there loud and clear. So listen to what Matthew says at this point. 
He gives us a, a bit more detail in what exactly happened that day. He says, Behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But Jesus did not answer her a word. You see, she's come to Jesus in faith. She's asking for his help. And initially, in response to that prayer, that plea, Jesus said nothing. He just sat there in silence. It is quite strange, isn't it? It's perplexing. And yet I'm sure that you can maybe relate to this situation that this woman finds herself in. There's maybe some particular issue that you've prayed about yourself. Maybe many times you've prayed about it, and it is as if all you hear back from heaven is silence. There doesn't seem to be any answer forthcoming, at least not yet. And it puzzles you, just as I'm sure this woman was puzzled at how Jesus, in response to her prayer, said nothing to her, made no answer to her initially, said not a word to her. And so what did she do in response to that silence from the Lord? Well, she persisted in prayer. She kept on asking Jesus for the help that only he can give. In some ways, she's a little bit like a real-life version of the persistent widow that Jesus told the parable about. You remember the parable in Luke 18. Jesus says, in a certain city... There was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterwards he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. Jesus added, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. You see, the point of that parable is that you're to keep on praying, even when you've not heard an answer yet, to your prayer. Don't lose heart. Keep praying. And as Jesus tells us, if even an unrighteous judge would answer in time, how much more will your loving Heavenly Father answer in his perfect time? And that's the approach the woman took that day, wasn't it? Even though the answer to her petition didn't come immediately, she kept on asking. Her prayer was marked with persistence and as well as that it was marked with love for others the prayer was motivated by love for others who's she praying for she's not praying for herself no she's praying for her daughter who is in great need and out of love for this daughter she comes to Christ in faith and she prays persistently for her that's a great lesson for us here in terms of how we pray for others in need and perhaps especially how we pray for our children. Uh, J.C. Ryle gives us some great wisdom here. He says, where there is a praying mother, there is always hope. Fathers and mothers are especially bound to remember the case of this woman. They cannot give their children new hearts. They can give them Christian education and show them the way of life, but they cannot give them a will to choose Christ's service and a heart to love God. Yet there is one thing they can always do. They can pray for them. Such prayers are heard on high. Such prayers will often bring down blessings. Never, never let us forget that the children for whom many prayers have been offered seldom finally perish. Let us pray more.
for our sons and daughters, even when they will not let us speak to them about religion. They cannot prevent us speaking for them to God. A wonderful example of prayer this unnamed Gentile woman gives to us. Her prayer sprang from faith in Jesus. It was marked with persistence and it was motivated by love for others. May we pray those kinds of prayers ourselves, filled with faith, filled with persistence, filled with love. Now, having considered the prayer, let's move on now to the parable that we find in these verses. And if you thought that Jesus remaining silent was perplexing, wait until you hear what he actually said when he eventually spoke. This woman has come to Jesus in faith, as we've seen. She has presented her plea, her prayer, her petition to him, persistently calling out to him on behalf of her daughter. And here's how Jesus responded when eventually he spoke. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now these are some of the most surprising words that Jesus ever spoke. He sets before this woman this very unusual parable. In those days, the Jews would sometimes refer to the Gentiles as dogs. And that was a a pejorative term, it was an insulting term, it was intended to offend. And Jesus, it seems, is saying something offensive to this woman. Not only does it appear that he is refusing to help her, which would be bad enough on its own, as well as that he is also referring to her and her family as dogs. And it sounds as if Jesus is saying, we Jews are the true children, and you Gentiles are just dogs. And it sounds terribly prejudiced, doesn't it? It sounds exclusive. And so what is going on here? What are we to make of those words of Jesus? We need to look at the words of Jesus very closely here to avoid misunderstanding what he's saying. There are really two things that we need to clarify about that little parable. And that is, firstly, that it's about a priority, not a prejudice. It's about a priority, not a prejudice. So look carefully again at what Jesus says there in verse 27. Let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now that little word first makes all the difference to that sentence, doesn't it? Take that word first out of the sentence and it reads very differently. It sounds, if you take the the word first away, it sounds like there is food for the children only, but none for the dogs, which would mean that Jesus is the saviour for Jews only and not a saviour for Gentiles. And yet that little word first makes a world of difference, doesn't it? It means that there is bread for the children and the dogs. Jesus is saying both will be fed, but there is an order to the feeding. The children in the household have the dinner first, and then the dogs get fed afterwards. You see the point of the parable, don't you? Jesus is saying he is the saviour for both Jews and Gentiles. And yet there is an order by which that salvation is given to the world. The gospel went to the Jews first, and then the Gentiles after them. So Paul says in Romans 1, for example, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And then here's the order, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek or the Gentiles. And therefore, in the ministry of Jesus, the public ministry of Jesus, there was a priority, not a prejudice, but a priority. In his ministry, he was to go to the Jews, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and to proclaim the gospel to them first. But even though that was the priority in Christ's ministry, that's not to say that the gospel is only for the Jews. 
No, it was always God's intention that his saving grace would flow out to the ends of the earth. In his promises to Abraham, God had said, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The blessing of God will flow to people from every family, every nation of the earth in the end. And it would be the work of the apostles after Jesus to then take that same gospel to the Gentile nations of the world so that people from any and every nation can receive God's saving grace in Christ. Of course, at the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus says to the apostles, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And since Jesus said that, the gospel has been going out to the four corners of the earth and people from across the whole globe are receiving God's grace in Christ. Even people like us, here we are tonight, Gentile people. We are the dogs in the parable. And our time has come to feast on what the Master has to give to us. We're feeding on Christ, receiving in him the grace of God who saves us. So this parable is about a priority, not a prejudice. And also it's about inclusion, not exclusion. Now at first glance, the parable sounds exclusive, doesn't it? Sounds like Jesus is pushing the Gentiles away by calling them dogs. If you call someone a dog, it doesn't sound very welcoming, does it? And yet, again, Jesus has chosen his words very carefully, as he always did. In Greek, there are two words for dogs. The first is the word kouon, which refers to a large, fierce, savage dog, as someone has translated it. And so if you call someone a kouon, that would definitely be an insult. You would be saying they're a large, fierce, savage person. A kouon is unclean. A kouon is a wild dog out in the street. Uh, the kind of dog you wouldn't welcome into your home. Stay out in the street and eat from the rubbish tip. And yet that is not the word that Jesus used here. He used the other word for dog, which is kunarion which refers to a very different kind of dog. It refers to a small, domesticated pet dog. A kunarion belongs in the home. A kunarion belongs with the family. It is welcomed there. It is part of the family. And that's why the kunaria in the parable are present. They are by the table, by the, the family dining table, as the, the children are eating their dinner sitting there by the table and wagging their tails. And you see, the point is, this parable is about inclusion, not exclusion. Jesus is saying Gentile people belong within the household of God. And yes, there is a difference. The Gentiles are different to the Jews in a host of different ways. And yet they're not to be excluded. They belong in the household. They are welcome at the table. They are part of the family. And you see, when you look at the words of Jesus here very closely, you see this parable about the children and the dogs is about a priority, not a prejudice. And it's about inclusion, not exclusion. And it's taken us a few minutes to work our way through that, but to her great credit, the woman gets it straight away, doesn't she? She understands the parable quicker than I would have done and perhaps you would have done as well. We might be confused by the parable for a while. And yet to her great credit, she knew what Jesus was saying. She understood what he meant in this parable. But she grasped it immediately. How do we know that, we un that she understood it straight away? Because it becomes clear when she speaks that she has understood the parable. Because she picks up this parable, doesn't she? And she runs further with it. Maybe with a smile on her face, she says to Jesus, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And she's saying, Jesus, I understand that there is a right priority in your ministry, that you have been sent to the Jews, and only afterwards will the gospel go out to Gentiles like me. The children are being fed and the little pet dogs 
who nonetheless belong to the same household, will be fed shortly. But she continues, even when the children are having their meal, you know what kids are like, some of the food ends up on the floor. And you know what dogs are like, they just snaffle it up straight away. And when the dogs do that, they, they get just a little taste in advance of what is coming to them soon enough anyway. And so even though I'm a Gentile, even though the gospel has not yet come to people like us, would you just give me a little taste in advance of the kind of grace that is coming to us soon enough anyway? Send some of the crumbs my way. Would you heal my daughter? It's a great answer, isn't it? She understands the parable. She knows where she stands in relation to this household of God. She knows that there is grace coming her way as well because she belongs in the household. Now what does it mean for us then today? It means this. The grace of God in Christ that was held out to the Jew first and that this woman, even as a Gentile, just had a a small foretaste of is now offered in its fullness to Gentile people like us. And so now, today, Gentiles are no longer just feeding on the crumbs that fall from the table. No, even the Gentiles now have a place at the table as full members of the household of God, feeding on Christ by faith, satisfied in him. Because the time has come for the Gentiles to receive Christ. So Christ, sorry, Paul says to the Ephesians, so then you, you Gentiles, are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. The question is, where are you, are, where are you in relation to this household that Jesus is speaking of in these verses? Even though you're a Gentile, at one time far off, have you been brought into God's family through faith in Jesus, adopted as one of his children, welcomed to his table, satisfied in all that he gives to you in Christ? The time for the Gentiles to receive Christ is now here. And so if you've not done so before, come to him. Come to him in faith like this woman did and become a part of the household of God. Well, we've considered this evening the prayer that this woman offered to Jesus, then the parable that he told her, and then finally, and very briefly, we'll notice as well the power that is at work through Jesus, the power that is at work through Jesus. And having heard what this woman had to say, Jesus responded then by saying to her, For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. She's demonstrated her her faith in Jesus. And Jesus is pleased to answer prayer when people come to him in faith. Mark tells us that she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. This woman's faith was well placed. It was in Jesus. And all throughout Mark's Gospel, as we've worked our way through these first seven chapters, we've seen, haven't we, that time and time again, Mark has told us that Jesus is able to exercise divine power, divine authority over many things, over sickness, over death, over sin, over unclean spirits, even over nature. And here is that same power at work again, through Jesus. He is able to deliver this little girl from the demon that was afflicting her. And it is a great encouragement, isn't it, to those who come to Jesus like this woman did, coming to him in faith and crying out to him for help, bringing all of your needs before him and as well as that, bringing the needs of your loved ones to him as well. The encouragement is your faith is well placed because Jesus is able to help. And as we've seen from this story, the answer may not come immediately. You may be perplexed for a little while as you have to wait. 
And yet the answer comes in the end. And through his divine power, he is able to deliver all of his people from all of their afflictions. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, we turn to you in prayer now. We thank you for what we see in these verses from Mark chapter 7. We thank you for the model for prayer that is given to us by this woman whose prayer was filled with faith in Jesus and who prayed persistently and who prayed out of love for those in need. Father, we ask you'd help us to pray like that, to pray with full confidence in Christ and to continue in prayer even when the answer seems slow in coming. Father, perhaps we've been praying for various things for many years and still the answer has not yet come. Help us to be persistent in prayer. And may we pray for those who are in need and perhaps especially for those members of our own households who are not yet converted. As we see this woman coming to Jesus pleading for her daughter, we think of those family members belonging to our households who are in need of your grace. And may we keep on bringing them before the throne of grace. May we not lose heart in prayer. Father, we thank you that our prayers are heard and that in time, in your perfect timing, you answer those prayers. We also thank you for what Jesus teaches through this short parable about the priority in his ministry and yet how even the Gentiles can be included in your household and feast at your table. Thank you that we ourselves have come to experience that if we're trusting in Christ. And we pray that many others who are currently outside may come in as they trust in Christ themselves and receive the grace that you show to us in him. May they too be made a part of the household of God and welcomed to your table and satisfied with Christ. We praise you that our Lord Jesus is sovereign over all things, even over the powers of darkness, even over sickness and death. And so encourage us to keep on coming to him in prayer because he is able to help and he will deliver his people from all their afflictions in the end. In his name we pray all of these things. Amen. Closing hymn this evening is number 150. The race that long in darkness pined has seen a glorious light. The people dwell in day who dwelt in death's surrounding night. Hymn number 150 will stand and sing. Receive these words of benediction. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.